And here you can actually see an animal that was imaged with microcomputer tomography. So this is X-ray based. And this is a dead fish. So all others are living fish, but here you can actually see the heart, the ventricle, and the vessels that are connected to the ventricle. And you see quite a lot of detail uh, with high resolution with these kind of approach approaches, even in adult animals that are no longer transparent. But uh, zebrafish, and I uh, recently heard that also in killifish, now they develop this, uh, this kind of model. <laughs> you have a mutant, which is called Casper, where they have completely removed the pigments even in adult fish. So you can see this fish is adult, and you can see here the eggs inside the belly of the female. And the advantage of using this model is that you can take uh, advantage of the transparency of the fish uh, for longer longer uh, time periods, not just in development. Uh, of course, you, you need to consider you are here working with a, with a bigger uh, animal, but still it allows you to see a bit further um, with, the, with the fish life. This model was originally was used for uh, cancer biology, cancer research. So they wanted to see how cells were, um, were invading the body. Uh, but I would say that nowadays Casper is is widely used in in different areas of research uh, with zebrafish. So another reason that zebrafish is so widely used is that, as I mentioned before, I started the presentation is that they can regenerate almost anything. So they regenerate the eye. If you do uh, a hole in the brain, it will regenerate. You can kill uh, uh, pancreatic cells, uh, uh, and they will they will come back. You can cut the fin, which comprises bones, vessels, nerves, and it will grow back. And you can even do an injury that kills 30% of the ventricle of the heart. The fish not, not only survive, but the, the heart completely repairs and, and recovers its function and regenerates. And actually the lab, and uh, I'll tell you a bit more about it, is focusing exactly in the in, in a cardiac structure, so the cardiac valves, that we are uh, interested in understanding how they regenerate, but most people are actually uh, interested in understanding what happens when you do a cryo injury in the heart, which is the equivalent to uh, myocardial infarction, and uh, to understand how the fish has the capacity to to repair and regenerate this uh, this injury, and um, and uh, how can we somehow understand these regenerative mechanisms to transpose to to humans. So an, another advantage of using zebrafish, and this is by coupling, of course, the fact that we have a lot of eggs, that they are transparent, that they are quite small at early stages of development, is that we can do a lot of high throughput screens. It can be genetic chemical screens, for example, where you can keep the fish in 96 well plates, a single larvae per well, and you can test uh, as many compounds uh, uh, as you wish. And this allows us, um, so you would say, well, we cannot go from this to, to a patient, but this allows us to narrow down um, the, the type of uh, compounds that actually have an effect in the organ or in the phenotype that we are interested, in, and then to validate them in mammalian uh, systems. So this is actually one of the main advantages that uh, you have labs that only do this. So they use zebrafish just for screens. And I think for all these reasons together, zebrafish has been increasing uh, its visibility within research. Um, you can see, so people started using it in the 90s, and I think it's it's obvious that, that we are uh, having more and more papers published uh, using zebrafish as a model. And this is also true uh, when considering that zebrafish is used as a disease model. So many of the diseases can be modeled in, in zebrafish. So I'll go a bit more into the genetics to explain you why we can do this kind of uh, uh, study. So zebrafish, of course, when you try to position, you know, you see these uh, trees, seems like zebrafishes or, or fish teleos in general are very far from humans. But in fact, zebrafish has 70% of um, conserved, 70% of the human genes. Uh, the chromosome, uh, chromosomal organization is not so different from zebrafish. And uh, 26,000 uh, 26, protein coding sequences have been identified. And this uh, can change a little bit depending on the annotation, but I would say this is fairly uh, 
people have agreed to this to this number. The only thing, the few things that you also need to take into consideration is that zebrafish doesn't really have sex chromosomes, uh, meaning that if you are doing research related to this, zebrafish may not be the best model. And zebrafish had what is called a teleos genome duplication. It means that you have an extra duplication of the genome in zebrafish, which results in the fact that most genes where you have one gene in humans may be represented by two genes in zebrafish. Okay? And this makes things just a little bit more complex because often what you need to do if you want to understand gene function is to, that you need to mutate the two paralogs in zebrafish in order to understand the function of this gene that will be represented by one in, in humans. So now I'll try to just give you a, an overall notion of the toolbox, of the genetic toolbox that is being used with the uh, zebrafish. So I would say that, that um, genetic manipulation is something that is quite relevant when you are working with zebrafish. And it's relatively easy to do if you, once you have established the protocols, you basically just need a micro injector, eggs and, and, and uh, a stereoscope to screen your fish. And I think it's relatively easy and simple to do it nowadays, at least for some of the tools that I will mention. So as I said, it, you just need a micro injector. So basically what we usually do is that we inject with a capillary the eggs of fish, usually of zebrafish, usually at one cell stage. And this will allow the either the introduction of, of, um, of, of DNA sequences or uh, direct genome editing, which uh, can be do can be done, for example, with the CRISPR-Cas9 technology that I'll tell you a bit more. So the point is that you do this, you inject the, the, the egg. Of course, you can analyze the the fish immediately uh, after you do this first round of um, of injections, but you can also uh, create in some cases stable lines that you can keep for multiple generations, and then you don't have to come back to this injection phase. You just created a stable line that can be further used, either a mutant or a transgenic fish. So reporter lines are actually one of the main. Uh, um, tools in zebrafish, it allows you to visualize cells and tissues. And now I think we are in an era where we keep talking about single cell studies. So people really want to understand cell heterogeneity and, and, and how cells are behaving at a singular level. And I think uh, uh, this, the use of these reporter lines uh, helps us a lot because we can actually visualize the behavior of these cells in the living animal. And this is just an example uh, of a line uh, where you can see different cell types, uh, namely in the brain and neural cells uh, that are stained with different colors. So for that, we take often uh, uh, advantage of uh, transgenic uh, tools. So transgenesis is the process of introducing a gene, which we call transgene, um, into the genome of, uh, of an organism, in this case of zebrafish. We usually use uh, plasmids uh, to, to introduce in the fish. And essentially there are two main, uh, if, if for now we forget a little bit the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, tools, but we often use two approaches to introduce this uh, transgene into the genome of the zebrafish, which are either meganuclease or transposase, where, where essentially you can do a random integration of this transgene into the genome of the, of the animal, okay? And I remember before this existed, and it was extremely difficult to actually integrate anything into the genome of the fish. And I remember when people started using these kind of tools, that was, you know, this huge breakthrough into the creation of uh, transgenic animals. And, and, and suddenly you went from having just a few labs that had transgenic uh, lines into, into a, a more broad or global capacity to, to create these lines. And, and, and I would say that now any small lab can actually do this, uh, these lines by using these tools. So of course, with, with the growth of transgenesis, I think this also came with the, with the more and more complexity in terms of reporter uh, uh, proteins. And, and I would say anything is possible at this, at this moment. You can use a number of different reporters that can after be combined. And this allows you also to understand a bit more the complexity of uh, cell mm -hmm. behavior. 
And this is just an example of a reporter line where essentially what we do is that we insert uh, this reporter protein, in this case, GFP, uh, with the promoter, with a specific promoter that we know to be associated to a specific cell type or to a specific function. And here you can see an example of a line that is showing the vasculature of zebrafish, which is labeled with GFP. And this, I think, already gives you an idea of uh, the amount of information that you can do just from getting these very simple uh, uh, transgenic lines. Mohamed, I don't know if people want to ask questions or interrupt me. I, it's uh, um... uh, Annabelle, I think we can, you I'm, you can continue your talk and then we will have like a okay a okay discussion definitely. If if there is anything that is not clear, you can obviously interrupt me. Okay. No, I do. You can. Um, yes, of course. Of course. Okay. <laughs> so, but in addition to doing these fluorescent reporter lines, which are very interesting to understand cell behavior, so you can follow migrating cells, etc. Uh, you can also use tools that are more to manipulate systems. So you can you can do a number of overexpression lines where you are increasing the levels of, of a specific coding sequence. You can use, for example, dominant negative approaches. And this is just an example. For example, if you use a dominant negative form of a receptor that is that blocks then the activity of a specific signaling pathway. This is a way of blocking the signaling pathway. So you can do this without actually mutating the genes. Mm -hmm. You can do a gain of function, which is, uh, which is the opposite. Basically, you inject a form of, uh, for example, of, re of a receptor that is constantly activating the pathway. So this would be called a gain of function approach. We can do each shock inducible lines, and this is I'd say one of the most common tools that is used. So basically, you put an each shock promoter driving the expression of something, of a coding sequence of interest, and this uh, can be triggered just by uh, exposing the fish to higher temperatures. And then you increase the expression of this coding sequence either everywhere in the in the fish or in a localized manner. For example, here you have. Uh, Local, it's called local ejox that you can actually uh, activate either physically, you can use a needle that is warm, or you can use now uh, light, for example, infrared to induce this ejox. So you increase the temperature in a very localized manner. And this is quite interesting to, to just see the impact of increasing the coding, this coding sequence in a very local uh, um, site. Another thing that we use a lot is our cell tracing tools. So the Creelog system, I would say it's one of the, the most famous because it's also widely used in, uh, in mice. And this actually is an example of uh, the mice lab. Um, and uh, we use this a lot, for example, to see. <clears throat> so the Creelog system allows you to to trace cells that even if they switch off the original promoter that you are using, they will keep being fluorescent. So they will keep having the same color. And this allows you to see cells that are progenitors, uh, to see where they end up when they become, when they differentiate and, and they integrate the tissue. So for example, here, we use these kind of tools to see where neural crests uh, were going, whether they were contributing to valve formation. And here you can see at early stages of development, you see this pink cell, we know that it's coming from the neural crest niche. And then we see that in adult stages, you, you have far more cells that are all accumulating in one point of the valve. And this is actually quite interesting because if you would just use regular reporter lines, you know, when the cells become valve cells, they switch off the, the, the reporters of when they are uh, progenitors. And you can also use <clears throat> cell tracing tools that are photoinducible. So here we used, it's called the Kaeda protein. So it's a protein that changes color when you expose them to a specific wavelength. And you can see these magenta cells that you can actually trace them to see where they end up later on. Um, another system that um, is actually adapted. So we adapt a lot of tools from Drosophila. So it's nice that you will have a talk, uh, you'll have a talk on Drosophila today. So one of these systems, it's the Gulf War UAS system. And, and the advantage of this system, I will not tell you the details, but the advantage of the system is that you have two lines, one line, which basically it's the, the promoter or the regulatory region driving the expression of Gulf War. And then you combine with 
as many lines as you want that have a UAS sequence uh, driving the expression of a gene of interest. And it's only when you combine these two lines that you will have the expression of this gene of interest. And the advantage of this is that you can have uh, a library of different GAL4 UAS lines that then you combine as you wish. And imagine they want to express a specific gene in vessels, cardiomyocytes, uh, nerves, and so on. You just need to have different GAL4 lines that are driving the expression in these different uh, cell types and tissues, and you combine it with your UAS line with the CODI sequence that you are interested in. And finally, I would say one of my favorite systems is that we can uh, do genetic ablation uh, uh, experiments. And one of the most used system is the nitroreductase metronidazole system. Um, there are some people working with uh, diphtheria toxin and so on, which is, I, I would say, what is more used in mice. And essentially, this, uh, this tool um, is based on the fact that you express this NTR or nitroreductase um, in specific cell types or tissues. And here you can see an example. So everything you see in pink is actually uh, expressing NTR. So these are the valve cells in, in the zebrafish heart. You see here the ventricle, the atrium, and you see the valve cells. And when we put the fish inside water with metronidazole, which is a prodrug, these cells will undergo apoptosis. And, and, and this is absolutely fantastic. You don't have to inject. It's a very simple protocol. And uh, depending on the line, the efficient can be more or less uh, high. But it's a very nice way of, uh, of uh, understanding the role of specific cells and, and as well in zebrafish, the regenerative process, once you kill these cells, what happens to the tissue and, and how does it recover? Okay, but what about protein function? So these are, of course, these all these tools I told you are very interesting to understand cell dynamics and, and uh, uh, even the role of specific cells, but often we are interested in understanding specific gene function. And I don't have to tell you by now, I think that the mutagenesis is a genetic alteration that can alter the, the protein function. And uh, that you have two types of genetics, I would say. <clears throat> you have forward genetics, when you you start in a phenotype and then you try to understand, and I would say this, this uh, is what people were doing the most in the beginning. So you have a phenotype and then you start to identify, you try to identify the gene that is causing this phenotype. And uh, nowadays we are more uh, using reverse genetics where basically you start by mutating the, the gene and you want to see what is the function of this gene and you try to describe its phenotype. So I think as in many other models, the, the beginning of mutagenesis in zebrafish was with, um, with uh, these large screens uh, where they were using um, potent mutagens such as ENU. And the idea was to mutate randomly as many genes in as many animals as possible, then identify which animals had the phenotype and then try to understand which gene was actually being mutated. And this was actually a, a huge effort and you, you probably have heard already of uh, uh, Nusslein Vollard's lab. Uh, she was uh, also working in Drosophila and she did this uh, similar screen in Drosophila and then she eventually did the same in zebrafish. And <clears throat> thanks to this concerted effort, not just with her, but also labs from Boston, uh, I would say the most famous uh, number journal uh, or issue uh, associated with zebrafish research was published in ninety six where basically they published the, this uh, screen. So they were describing the different mutations depending on the, on the organs that were being uh, affected. And I, I really like this, uh, this list because in fact, if you look to some of these names, they are, most of them are now PIs and I would say they, they uh, are the basis of the zebrafish community nowadays. And they are some of the, um, uh, of the main labs that are creating, generating the tools that we are all using now. And this, here you, you see the Destiny is actually the lab that I was before. So <clears throat> these kind of zebrafish mutation projects are still ongoing. So things are a bit different now, but the point is still 
to have a, a stock center where you can have access to these uh, to these uh, uh, mutants. These are usually uh, uh, single nucleotide uh, mutations, so it's not large deletions, um, which comes with some advantages. Um, and, and of course, what happens often is that you can actually order these mutants and you can combine also with the, with the large mutations or larger mutations that you can do with, uh, with CRISPR-Cas9. Okay, <clears throat> so, but of course, you know, you need to consider that when you are working with these kind of approaches and uh, unless you buy these mutants from, from these stock centers, but if you want to do these kind of uh, approaches, you are highly limited by the fact that you cannot target a specific gene that you are interested. And the identifying the, the causing gene of a phenotype when you don't know it, it's, it's not so trivial and not every lab can do it. So of course, people are more and more, and I would say in the past years, this has become the, the rule in, in most labs is to go from gene to phenotype. And zebrafish, in the beginning, it was practically impossible to do uh, a direct mutagenesis in zebrafish. And people were using a lot something that is called a morpholino. So morpholinos are, are oligomer, uh, oligomer that inhibits either uh, RNA uh, splicing or the translation. And it's something that you can use. So it's, it's transient. So with cell division, um, this compound will get more and more diluted. So you have less and less effect. But what people could do is that they could inject this morpholino in, in the egg, and they could see what we consider a knockdown phenotype and what was the, the, the consequence of inhibiting, not silencing completely, but inhibiting a specific gene. However, I would say uh, in around 2014, 15, people started realizing that actually you might have some phenotypes uh, with your morpholino, but then when you, you are looking to the mutant, the phenotype is either different um, or inexistent. So two things resulted from this. So one was that people started questioning morpholinos and, and they started uh, um, understanding that not all morpholinos were giving specific phenotypes. And I think there was a huge movement within the community to actually understand the best ways of using morpholinos without uh, without providing wrong data. There was, I think, a bit of a, an allergic reaction. Suddenly, no one wanted to use morpholinos. So um, uh, in 2017, this paper came out where they were actually trying to explain you how you define a good or a bad morpholino, I'd say, and that you can still use it as long as it's properly validated. Um, but it also made us understand that uh, you know, it was a bit strange that you could have a, a phenotype in a morpholino that was potentially true, but then your mutant uh, um, uh, fish was not showing any phenotype. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this. So I think suddenly this was also, this, this uh, controversy was also coming more or less at the same stage that people started to have access to some tools. So in the beginning, it was quite challenging using zinc finger nucleases and tail end. I think this was pretty much the beginning. But then with the, with the growth of CRISPR-Cas9, and we realized it was actually easy to make zebrafish mutants. And this was really a huge breakthrough in the field. And I don't have to tell you uh, what is uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 at this point, but what we are doing, so I would say that we started by doing small deletions. So uh, by using a single uh, guide RNA, this is what people were basically doing, just mutating different areas of the gene. We realized that the areas that we were mutating could, could uh, highly affect the, the outcome in terms of phenotype. Then people realized that maybe we can do some uh, larger deletions and remove uh, entire exons. In some cases, if the if the gene is small enough, you can actually remove the entire gene, and, and specifically the coding sequence. And in some cases, you can also remove. And, and we have some tools in, in in the field where people have actually removed the promoter region, so you are actually silencing your gene. Of course, for all of these, you need to take into consideration 
what are the, the side effects, right? Are you affecting downstream genes? Are you affecting the, the chromatin organization? And, and what can be also the impacts of doing these different types of deletions? So uh, you, of course, you always need to keep all this in mind. And this also comes with what I said. So often it happens that you don't have a phenotype. So, so uh, um, I was I was actually in the Diaz lab when they started publishing all this uh, literature about uh, genetic uh, uh, compensation and transcriptional adaptation, where they realized that actually the mutated uh, gene was actually inducing the uh, an adapting gene that was actually compensating for the phenotype, and then in the end. You didn't really have a phenotype. So actually, you need to take in this, into consideration these kind of issues when you don't have a phenotype and whether you can do different deletions so that you can actually see something that is more relevant. But the CRISPR-Cas9 is not just used at this point for uh, gene mutation. I think more and more people are realizing that you can use it for basically any kind of uh, uh, genome editing. You can do knocking models, so you can actually introduce now your reporter sequences that I was mentioning in the beginning that we are using mostly the transposase and the meganuclease systems. You can actually now use the CRISPR-Cas9 to introduce these sequences into the genome in specific areas of the genome. Of course, you need to consider whether you want to silence the gene or not, where you are inserting your sequence. And I would say that <clears throat> with the development of the tools, this is actually becoming more and more refined and you can actually get really nice uh, results and it's becoming easier to get these perfect insertions uh, into the zebrafish genome. Another thing that uh, I think the field, because we really like stable lines, right? Um, what the field is actually benefiting is that we are now creating, or the field, the, some researchers have created now some stable lines where you can actually condition the expression of Cas9 and of the guide RNAs that you are interested in um, with, uh, with the CRIS system. So this allows you to condition when you want to start expressing. Of course, this does not uh, assure that you are going to have uh, a complete uh, silencing of the genes that you are targeting, but at least you have an idea. So you should first um, test your guide RNAs to make sure that they are actually efficient. And then with this approach, you can actually condition when you want uh, these kind of deletions to happen. So I think I would end this part regarding the, um, the resources and tools by just mentioning this, uh, this uh, website where basically you can get almost any information. If you like zebrafish, I think you, you should obviously take advantage of this uh, ZIFI. So it's a resource where you can actually have uh, the information regarding different genes, papers, and even uh, labs. So this is just an example where you can identify which reporter lines uh, there are available and mutants and so on. And this, I think, um, is a really fantastic tool that uh, we use on a daily basis. Mohammed, should I stop or can I briefly talk about the work of the we lab? Can, we, of course you can do so. We can extend for five more minutes. Uh, that's fine. No, I'll do that. Okay. So I just want to give you an example. So, so my lab is interested in understanding cardiovascular disease and regeneration. And um, we are doing a lot of fundamental research. Actually, I have a human here, but uh, I would say that we are very fundamental research. And I'm interested in, in the cardiac valves, which, as I mentioned, they are the structures inside the heart, and they're the ones that guarantee that the blood flows uh, in one direction. And when the blood, when the valves are not functioning properly, what happens is that the heart needs to beat much more and then you may have cardiac failure. And in humans, there are four different valves on two that separate the atrioventricular uh, compartments and two in the major arteries. While in zebrafish, because you don't have septation of the chambers, you only have two valves. So you have the atrioventricular valve here, which is actually um, the 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 structure that people tend to study uh, more in comparison with the, the outflow valve. The point is that independently on these differences between the models, um, if you do a section through the valves, they all have the same structure. So you have this valve endothelium, which surrounds the valve interstitial cells. 
that are responsible to secrete a lot of matrix. And this matrix is actually what confers the biomechanical properties of the valves and allows them to close. So in the lab, so we know that these valves, they, they actually regenerate quite well. So we established this model, but they can also uh, undergo uh, pathological uh, effects and, and they can become diseased valves. And we are interested in understanding why the same tissue can have uh, can can respond to injury in a very positive way and regenerate, or it can, in some conditions, become disease, uh, become uh, um, uh, defective due to disease. So we have mainly two uh, main axes of the lab. So one is understanding uh, cardiac valve uh, regeneration. So as I said, we use, and, and here the point is to show you the different type of tools and how we use them in practical terms. So we use this NTR MTZ system to kill the valve cells. And with this, we were able to see that when we kill the cells, we actually trigger regeneration. And you see that the ablated valves will start recruiting new cells and they will form new valves. And here you can actually see that the cells, the number of new valve cells increase in, in time. And with this model, we were actually trying to understand factors that could promote regeneration. So we used uh, uh, different tools to address TGF beta signaling because we knew TGF beta signaling was uh, important in valve development. And these are just some examples. So we used a chemical uh, compound that blocks TGF beta signaling. We use a dominant negative form of the receptor that, as I mentioned, is a way of blocking the signaling pathway. We use the mutant for the ligand, so a mutant for TGF beta 1B. And we overexpress this ligand TGF beta 1B. So Essentially, the idea was to show with these three tools what happens when we block TGF beta signaling, and we show that we prevent cell cycle reentry and we have less cells in the valve. And what happens when we promote TGF beta signaling and we show that we have more cell cycle reentry and we have more cells in the valve. Okay, this is just an example of how you can manipulate the system to understand the biological processes. Another main axis of the lab is to understand uh, disease of the cardiac valve, and uh, we're focusing in calcification. So cardiac valves, but also vessels, are quite prone to these uh, calcification phenotypes. And of course, as you can imagine, this is a huge problem because then blood circulation is affected. Um, and they are, and it, these are extremely, extremely heterogeneous and progressive disorders that have been associated to many risk factors, including high cholesterol levels, smoking, diabetes, aging, so basically anything that you do in your life. So what we propose is to uh, develop a number of uh, chemical tools, uh, genetic tools. So we have a number of mutants and overexpression lines and even nutritional uh, uh, tools. So basically we are giving high fat diet to fish to see whether we can promote calcification. And this is just an example of a mutant where you can see in red the calcified. So this is a wild type. You see that there's not much calcification. But then when you look to the mutants, you see that you have calcification spread a bit everywhere, including in the heart. So it's what you see here in red. And the idea is to use these kind of tools to understand how these diseases are actually progressing. And here is just an example of um, a 3D model we did from imaged uh, samples in zebrafish. And you can actually see here the, the vascular cell. Here in uh, orange, you can see the calcified tissue. And in green, you can see an immune cell interacting with the calcified tissue. So it's actually a very nice way, taking advantage of all these tools, including genetic tools. And our report aligns with live imaging to actually see how cells are interacting to, to cause a phenotype. So um, actually, uh, this is uh, the end, I think. So this is my lab. And uh, as I said, we are we are moving to Toulouse and we'll, we'll be recruiting from uh, September. So if you would like to work with Zebrafish, <laughs> you should definitely talk with me. And I'm sorry if I have been silent until now, but uh, as I meant, as you can imagine, it's not easy when you're moving. But I'll be very happy to answer your questions and uh, anytime, even if you have questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Annabella. It was wonderful. I see here shining eyes. So I think <laughs> we have a lot of questions. I hope, but yes. I will, I will start myself actually with, with a technical question regarding mm -hmm. the image. So mm -hmm. when we use the model for screening, for example, because mm -hmm. it's, it's just a curiosity. So let me say, or let's say that you use um, 
a 96 well plate and you put uh, uh, one fish in each well mm -hmm. and then for example for drug screening is it something so you have to add the drug in the water mm -hmm. you have to add the drug in the food you have to inject no, no, no. in the water in, in the, the water. water directly yeah d'accord and i'm just trying to make a comparison comparison um I compare between yeah between cells so if you put your uh, oh it's not an incubation so you don't lose the water actually there is no evaporation as much you know uh, so, so yeah you so you, you, you may have a bit no we do need to keep them at 28 degrees okay so you know the, to 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 handle with concentration etc so mm. it's a bit tricky no okay so so the 96 well plates it's early stages right it depends on what is the readout you want to have if you want to see for example bone you cannot work with the 96 well plates because you need to work with older fish okay no. so then of course the bigger the well the less impact you will have of evaporation so usually what people do is that you have these chemical libraries right with thousands of drugs we usually use the same concentration 10 micromolar for everything and we can put it in three four larvae three to four wells and usually i don't think you have a lot of evaporation in a regular incubator at 28 degrees mm -hmm. but i cannot discard that the point is that you often need to change the water daily so then you are you know also replacing the drug also yeah you are safe yes yeah. and then it depends what is your readout are you going to you know image something specific with fluorescence? Are you going to check luciferase activity of uh, something as well? And you're macerating the fish. So there's different ways of doing. Now there's this uh, automated system that we actually are trying to to acquire for our lab, which is called the VAS system, where basically you have a machine that automatically sucks the fish into a capillar, puts it under the microscope, microscope images, and then puts it back in the in the well plate. Yeah. So you can, you know, you can image absolutely anything that you can imagine in an automated fashion. Super. It's really nice. Super, super. <laughs> well, so audience, I assume you have a lot of questions. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I don't know, the lady in pink, sorry. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, you hear her? I think so. Uh, clear presentation. Uh, actually, uh, I have a question about uh, chlorescent transporter lines and overexpression lines. Uh, could you explain more? I'm starting with these two. <laughs> No, myself, I didn't hear well. So you can come and then. Uh... <laughs> don't be shy, don't be shy. <laughs> I understood right. it was about the overexpression lines, but then I didn't understand the question. You can ask Cameron, yeah, there is. <laughs> so this is the online uh, limits. So somehow. <laughs> no problem. Uh, Okay. Good morning, Anabila. Thank you for this great presentation. Mm, thank um, you. Just a question about uh, fluorescent reporter lines. Yes. And overexpression lines. Just mm -hmm. just the difference. Could you explain more the difference? Ah, and okay. Especially reporter lines because you just showed some figures and but I didn't figure out the uh, mm. story. Okay, okay. So usually with reporter lines, you're also overexpressing because you're overexpressing the, the reporter protein, which is GFP and cherry, so the fluorescent protein. But this, in theory, does not have a, a, an effect, a biological effect in the fish. You just observe the cells. When I'm talking about overexpression lines, is to express, for example, BMP2, increase the expression of BMP2. So uh, you you are increasing, the, you introduce this coding sequence, which is driven by a specific promoter. It can be, for example, an ECHAC promoter, which allows you to make it in a specific moment. Or it can be, you know, you can use the promoter of a cell type or a tissue. And it means that you will be increasing the expression of this gene, the MP2, for example, in that cell or tissue. 
So that would be my definition of an overexpression line. But reporter, you just see fluorescence. You're not you're not doing anything biologically in theory. You're not affecting the biology of the fish. Is that clear? So uh, is it associated uh, somehow to uh, microscopy to see the fluorescence or? Yeah, yeah. So you use the reporter usually is to follow the the cells and tissues. You can also do overexpression lines where you have the expression of your coding sequence that you want to increase with the reporter uh, protein, with the fluorescent protein like GFP. But usually, you know, reporters, you want to follow the cells and tissues, overexpression, you want to increase the expression of a specific coding sequence. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Is that? Yeah. Sorry, If you say. <laughs> So Isabel from uh, Queen Mary London University, I assume she has a very interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Anabella. Hi. Hi. I'm always fascinated when I think of Seraphis regeneration of the heart. Yes. And wondering <laughs> uh, where is the field at this point? Like, What is known about our heart? Why don't we mm. regenerate? Or if we do, is it limiting? And what is the fish doing that we don't do? And can we, of course, mm. make our hearts regenerate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, I think we're what we're realizing with zebrafish is that it's far more complex than initially thought. I think people before were very much focusing in cardiomyocyte proliferation. If you increase cardiomyocyte proliferation, you solve the issue. And actually, I think now realizing it's far more complex than that you need to increase cardiomyocyte proliferation, but you need to remove the scar that was formed. You need to have a proper revascularization of the of the myocardium and so on. And this we see that is very well coordinated in zebrafish. Uh, there are different uh, theories right now or evidence of why zebrafish regenerates and and mammals don't. Some people say that, for example, uh, the fact that zebrafish cardiomyocytes are mononucleated, opposing to polynucleated in uh, in humans, can be one of the reasons in mammals in general. Um, but yeah, I think it's a very tricky field because as, as everything in biology, it's a coordinated effort of different cell types and genes, right? And, and I think to go from that to regenerating heart, it's, uh, it's complex. I was, I just came from, from a conference at the Weizmann Institute and they were talking a lot about, you know, using patches. And I think people are really trying to do a complex approach to regenerate the heart, but, uh, it's complex, and I think uh, that's why we need to keep studying zebrafish to understand this complexity. Claro, 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 claro. <laughs> yes, Amel. Yes, please. Yes. <laughs> bye, bye. So, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm, I'm Amal from the Center of Biotechnology of SPACS, mm -hmm. and I had a small experience with the zebrafish, so I have some quick questions. Uh, for the incorporation of some molecules, uh, mm -hmm. and then, uh, I mean, we, we had an experience with the toxicity tests, and also mm -hmm. with the, we, we, want, we wanted to test some molecules. Mm -hmm. So how can we make sure that this molecule has really uh, been incorporated in the cell. I mean, like sometimes it was discussed that these molecules um, cannot pass with the skin. So when we put it in the water, so mm. what is the mechanism actually for these incorporations? Oh, so <laughs> I'm not, well, yeah, toxicology is uh, complex. It's not, um, so what usually people do when you think about large chemical screens is that, you know, you just test as many as possible. And then you identify the ones that work. It's true when we want to work with one specifically. Yes. It's more tricky to, in, to, to be sure that it's actually, if you don't see a phenotype, it's because the drug is not working. And, or is it because it's not being absorbed? Then I would tell you, okay, so you can test in adult fish. And you can do IP injections or retroorbital injections, depending if you want uh, intraperitoneal or intravenous. Uh, and then at least you know that this issue of passing the skin is no longer an issue. Now, whether it will be absorbed by the cells, this, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very complex, but uh, I don't know. I, I don't know how do you know when you do in vitro studies, how do you know if the cell is actually entering the cells? I don't know how this is done as well. So, yeah. but I would tell you, yeah, if it's not working with larvae, you can always test in, in, 
in adult fish with injections. That's easy. Okay, so the next question is, is it possible to inject the mRNA for testing uh, an, an overexpression gene? So mm -hmm. when we noticed, for example, a mutation that causes an overexpression of some genes yeah, yeah. in a human, so would it be possible to inject yeah. the mRNA? And what is like uh, some uh, recommendations or something yeah. to, to make it useful? Yes, so... <laughs> Uh, when we were using a lot of morpholinos, we were also using a lot of mRNA injections. And we still do if we want to do a partial rescue. The only thing you need to keep in mind is that when you inject mRNA, it's going to dilute, right, with cell division. It's like the morpholino, right? Yes. So we, we are usually very fond of making stable lines. But when you want to test many things, yeah, doing an injection, uh, uh, injection of mRNA is, is uh, quite of a routine experiment. You need to stabilize this mRNA so that it's not so easily degraded upon injection. Okay. But then, um, you know, it's quite trivial. Um, there's not, it's not very complex. You just need to define, you need to tighter the amount of RNA that you are injection, injecting so that, you know, then the problem is not toxicity of too much RNA. Um, and yeah, um, there, yeah, I can help you with the protocol if you want, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's very trivial, I would say. Okay, thank you. Just one last question for, yes. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, so for for the injection, sometimes we had the problem uh, to, to, to really distinguish between, is it really, uh, um, I mean, when, when yeah. seeing with the confocal results, of, uh, and then we say, is it really due to this injection or is it a problem of manipulation or ah. a problem of manipulating the X? So sometimes, uh, I mean, I'm, I was working with health cells and something with the, the zebra fish because I'm working on uh, hearing loss. And then sometimes we face the uh, pictures from confocal microscopes. And then we said, is it exactly what we are looking for or is like, um, yeah. because of the injection or something like that. Yeah, so this, uh, my only advice is uh, do and do more and do more and do more. It's, uh, okay. you know, it's really, <laughs> you should have your, your controls, your negative controls yes, where you're not sure. injecting yes. whatever you are trying yeah. to manipulate. And because it's true that, you know, often I can tell you that many papers are publishing morpholino phenotypes that were just injection phenotypes. Okay. And, you know, uh, if, for example, when we are making lines, for example, when we're making mutant lines with CRISPR-Cas9, and sometimes we have these, you know, monster fish because they are very short and people in the beginning, they were very excited saying, oh, I have a phenotype. But then we realized that actually it's toxicity of the Cas9 and so on. So it's really, you have to have your negative controls to make sure, uh, for example, you can inject just Cas9 without the guide RNA. And, yeah. um, and, and you need to practice a lot the injection itself until you feel that you became skilled <laughs> yeah. if okay. you want to if you want to check for phenotypes if you just want to make lines you know you inject you let them yes. grow and then you screen them yes. but then if you need phenotypes then you need to really get a bit more skilled with your injections that's all yeah, yeah. thank you so much thank no, you thank you and good luck <laughs> thank you. well so annabella again thank you very much just oh, you're welcome if you could repeat this wonderful phrase, amazing phrase, <laughs> new uh, lab, new city, meaning recruitment of new postdocs. So <laughs> yes, say yes. it again, and then thank you very much. Yes, well, uh, for sure, I would, uh, I would be very happy to talk with you if you're interested in, in joining the lab. We actually have uh, positions at different levels, so yeah. don't be shy. <laughs> Do that. We have opportunities here. Okay. Thank you so much Thank and enjoy you. enjoy the, the workshop. I think it's beautiful to organize these kind of things. Thank you, Mohammed, for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.